Well, I've been predicting $30 silver for a couple of years, so uh, it's nice to be right. Uh, you know, I've, I've coined the phrase triple digit silver, you know, a decade ago, and uh, you know, I'm seeing people now starting to believe that is actually a possibility. Um, I think it should have happened a long time ago. Special coverage from the Rule Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida is brought to you by Contango Ore, developing Alaska's next gold mines. Hello and welcome back to the Gold Newsletter channel. My name is Kai Hoff and I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Sore Financial Group and together with Brian London, the host of the Gold Newsletter channel. And we're here at Boca Raton, we're at the Rule Symposium and I'm joined by Keith Newmeyer, President and CEO over at First Majestic Silver. Keith, it's great to have you back on the program. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's great seeing you as well and uh, you know, humid Boca Raton. Oh. It's, yes, like underneath my watch, there's quite a bit of humidity and moisture. Yes. <laughs> it is warm out here. Yes, uh, it is. What is it? Seventy percent humidity out here? Something like that? I don't know. It but feels you, like two hundred. To you be walk honest, walk outside and you start sweating instantly. So <laughs> it's a beautiful place. Though. It is. Beautiful. It's a nice setting, yeah. right? Um, yeah, Rick's done a great job putting this together. I, I think so as well. It's busy. It's well attended. I think so. Really mm -hmm. good people. Yeah. So. Really good people. Um, let, let, let's talk silver. Let's start on sure. the macro side. Uh, Keith, I always enjoy that with you. And uh, I, I recently watched an interview that you've done with Kitgo earlier this year, our good friends at Kitgo, and you mm -hmm. predicted $30 silver by year end. Mm -hmm. We're now trading at $31 and it's mid-year. Mm -hmm. right? uh, give us a bit of a rundown. How did that come about and uh, how, how happy are you with that? Well, I've been predicting $30 silver for a couple of years, so uh, it's nice to be right. <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've coined the phrase triple digit silver, you know, a decade ago, and uh, you know, I'm seeing people now starting to believe that is actually a possibility. Um, I think it should have happened a long time ago. In my presentation earlier today on stage, you know, uh, I was talking about the silver fundamentals and just the fact that um, even the Silver Institute's um, suggesting 1.2 billion ounces of consumption mm -hmm. in 2024. I've heard numbers as high as 1.4 billion ounces in a market whereby the miners are only producing 830 million mm -hmm. ounces a, a year. So, you know, I, 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 you know, where the silver is coming from, who knows, but it is, a, it is showing up in price, which is nice to see finally. And um, you know, I'm still expecting higher metal prices or silver prices. Now, let's talk about the impact of the higher prices as well. Like, what, what does that really mean? Like, especially supply and demand dynamics. Like, what, what does that look like? What are you seeing? I don't think it has any impact on supply and demand. I, I think that, you know, because the miners themselves need long-term pricing to be able to have the confidence uh, in, in making the necessary investments uh, to increase production. Uh, and that's not happening. You know, you also need to see governments also get in line with you know um, uh, getting ounces out of the ground, whether it's copper, whether it's silver, whatever metal, zinc, uh, you know, all, all these metals are very, very important in the green revolution. And the, you know, the governments are pushing solar panels, yet they they it takes 20 years to permit a mine. So so you know, if you're a gold company or a silver company, uh, you know, and and you have a discovery hole, um, um, which we've seen a few in the last year or so, uh, which is exciting to see, and you know, stocks do okay and so on and so forth. And, um, and investors, you know, make a little bit of money, but that executive team has to finance that asset for the next 10 plus years uh, just to get that thing permitted and get ounces out of the ground. As long as the governments don't, uh, you know, get on, get in line, you know, with their rhetoric, you know, because they're pushing all these, uh, you know, great ideas, green revolution, etc. But yet they make it so difficult for the mining sector. So, you know, thirty dollars silver is great. You know, I, you know, we're selling silver at thirty bucks right now, which is uh, so our margins are looking good, our profits are are increasing. But does it affect supply? No, not yet. Let's stay on the macro for a second because I want to talk first majestic after that and okay. how it affects your company in, in particular. Sure. But uh, what were really the reasons behind the price move? Was it just a technical move, or did you see more behind it? Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, I don't know um, <clears throat> really. Um, uh, you never know what's going on in the paper markets. You know, the you know the paper market mm -hmm. trades two hundred and thirty times the physical market on it on a daily basis. So that's a like crazy leverage. And I remember back in you know during the Reddit squeeze mm -hmm. uh, in. Uh, uh, 2021, I guess it was, um, you know, when silver went from about 18 to 30 in a matter of two days. And, and I remember the, the uh, uh, chairman of the CFTC going, getting on to MSNBC saying, oh, we successfully tapped down the silver price. And I'm going like, what? what what's a regulator care How? about the price? <laughs> yeah. Like, it's not their job to care about price, you know, and uh, I was really quite confused about that. And uh, 
Um, so I think there was an effort to suppress the prices back then. It was pretty obvious. Um, uh, this time around, the, the, I think it caught people off guard. And I, I, don't, I just don't think the, the, the energy is not there within the banking sector to continue with those games. I think there, there are you know, people in the sector, the banking sector I'm referring to, that are actually looking at the actual real fundamentals of the metal. And they're realizing that, hey, you know, maybe we shouldn't be holding this price back, uh, you know, as we have historically. And, you know, maybe we should let it go uh, to show some nat natural price that that's more, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, points at the fundamentals of the metal. Yeah, which is quite interesting because like, we've seen the move like, quite violently mid-May, roughly mm -hmm. early early yeah. May, mid-May. Yeah, and uh, I know you've caught, talked with, uh, about that topic uh, on other channels as well, but mm -hmm. you saw the four big banks or four big banks fly to China. And uh, speculation is that they talked about covering their ass, mm -hmm. meaning on the silver side that they were caught mm -hmm. off guard. As you as you mentioned, that's sort of what triggered the question, caught mm -hmm. off guard, being short, right. uh, a massive amount of silver. And they were maybe mm -hmm. talking to the Shanghai Metals Exchange saying, mm -hmm. hey, we, we, we need your help. Yeah. Is, is well, that something you've seen? Like, well, when you see the premiums in Shanghai at you know four or five dollars, what they're trading in the Comex, you know I think that tells you something. Yeah. Um, you know, and and you know I think the Comex players are offside, and um, and I, I I think they're they're probably you know whether they're at their financial limits or not, who knows? We're, we're not inside the, <laughs> the banking system in in, in, in any way, but um, it's nice to see that um, you know they're not leaning on the price as they historically has. Curious now is like looking forward a little bit as well. Like, what, why did the silver price not run further? Like, it seems like everybody was happy we broke finally through thirty dollars, but that's sort of where the steam ran out. Like, the engine lost steam there. You know, it's like any anything that trades. You know, whether it's a stock or a commodity, it doesn't really matter. But you know, people get used to a certain price, and uh, they they will buy at a certain price, they sell at a certain price. So I think we need you know the metal to stay at thirty dollars for a good couple of quarters and uh you know we're in the weakest uh period uh, for the metals you, you go back and look at 30-year charts june is always the low now uh, for gold and silver and uh, we've gone out through june and it held up quite nicely through that period of time and we're now in july which is the you know depths of the summer uh generally pretty low volume period uh you know metals generally don't start to improve until august september october and uh if if silver holds up to these prices uh over the next couple of months I, i'm expecting expecting $35 by the end of the year. I was going to say, are you upping your guidance now? <laughs> I am. I am. Yeah. I'm, I'm quite encouraged. Yeah. It was, like, it was interesting to see silver reconquer $30 as well because it dropped mm. below that for a little bit and yeah. uh, it, it came right back up. So did, yeah. a quite, quite interesting move. Mm -hmm. um, Let's talk first Majestic. Like, I'm really curious yeah. like what that higher silver price does for you as a producer now and mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the impacts you're seeing and uh, how has it done? Uh, how has it improved cash flow? Well, it, it, you know, it's new. This has just happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know, um, um, it's, it's, of course, you know, we sold some silver the other day at 31 bucks, and uh, that was obviously quite nice. It's been years since, uh, you know, we sold silver at that price before. But uh, so that's nice to see. But it's going to take some time, you know, uh, um, you know, a couple more quarters. And then, uh, you know, we had, you know, we had a bit of a rough first quarter. We've got two mines that are going through a bit of a transition right now. We had the... Uh, Lincoln Tata lose their water last uh, summer. Uh, one of their one of the um, uh, wells collapsed, and uh, we lost thirty percent of the water supply. So you know, I didn't want to lay off the workforce, so we kept running at at, at, at two thirds of the production. So our, we have high fixed cost, um, um, but less production. So of course that affects your your yeah. your profitability. So now that's re rectified itself. Uh, we found a brand new uh, great looking water well in April. So Lincoln, Lincoln Tata is now back up to 3,000 tons a day, which is nice. So it, but it takes a couple of months to, you know, to actually to see um, um, a bottom line improve there. Sandemus, we're leaving one, uh, a large vein, which called Jessica. We've been mining that for the last five years. Mm -hmm. And we're now leaving that vein, going into new whole vein system. So of course you've got this delay and uh, uh, that takes a couple of quarters. We're just going through that transition now. Um, Q2 numbers are coming out shortly and uh, you know Q2 looks a little bit better than Q1. Um, it's not where I'd like to see it. I, I think by Q3, Q4, uh, we're going to be back on track with our guidance and uh, looking forward to ending the year on a very positive note. I'm curious, like maybe I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I wrote down a buzzword is like generalists. When, when you see $30 silver, it's like I'm curious, like ha has the conversation changed? Do you see a bit of different inflow of maybe investors reaching out, uh, more generalist investors? Is that attracting a different audience? I wish that was the case. <laughs> um, you know, 
You know, I, I look at this time frame very similar to 1999-2000. Now, I've said this before, and, and I, 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 I honestly believe it because, you know, we, we had the NASDAQ hit 5,000 uh, in, in uh, uh, March of 2000. Mm. And uh, uh, over the next two to three years, uh, the NASDAQ dropped 80%. Um, and that was really with the signal for that. All that money had to find a home somewhere. And all that money went into, well, not all the money, but a ton of the money went into the mining sector. Some went into real estate and so on. But uh, um, nevertheless, the, uh, so, so, you know, you had silver at $5 an ounce. You had uh, gold at $240 an ounce. And over the next 10 years, you know, you saw silver, uh, gold go up eight times and, you know, silver go up 10 times. And then uh, uh, I think that's where we are. I think we do need to see some of these big cap stocks, NVIDIA, you know, Apple, Microsoft. I think we need to see some of the big money leaving that sector because the pension funds, the big mutual funds, the, the you know, the, the, the big money is not invested in the mining sector at all. Uh, you know, here we have a retail conference. You know, they, there's a lot of people here that have been investing in this sector for years, much, much of their lives. <clears throat> and then this is kind of the underpinning to the resource sector. But without that institutional shareholder base, it's, it's tough for these stocks to really to move in any kind of substantial way. And you look at the GDX and GDXJ and you can see that, you know, just, you know, even mm. though we've got $30 silver and $2,400 gold, these stocks haven't really moved a whole heck of a lot. So we really need the institutions back in this market. Yeah, there's $6 trillion sitting in money market funds right now. Mm. They're, you know, making 5% uh, annualized returns, which is okay, I guess. It's fairly risk-free. Mm. But uh, once once the sector, or once the, the general market starts to take a dive, those $6 trillion might be looking for a new home. Reminds me exactly what you mentioned of uh, 2000 uh, mm -hmm. as well. Is that something you would compare it to? Exactly. It's, um, uh, and I, I'm, I'm convinced it will happen. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, the, there are, there are guys out there kicking tires and then they do know that the sector is very undervalued. Uh, that's obvious. And I, I, I think we could all talk about that. And, but yet no one wants to be the first in. Right? So, yeah. I'm just looking at a Barrick or a Newman trading at a PE ratio of like three mm -hmm. and you got NVIDIA trading at 73. Yeah. Yeah, it so mm -hmm. sounds like there's a bit of a discrepancy here. Yeah, um, for sure. Well, let's talk confidence levels here, Keith. Like your $30 silver, like how much confidence does it give you maybe looking out outside, maybe doing an acquisition? Like, like how much confidence give it, does it give you moving forward for with well, the first majestic? Yeah, here? on the M and A front, you know, we're we're not going to be using thirty dollars to run, you know, long term, you know, uh, cash flows. Um, uh, we, we we will do a sensitivity for sure, so we'll know what it is at thirty. But when we do an actual valuation on what we should pay for an asset, we'll lose some use some lower number, um, and probably right now we probably use twenty five, you know, if just for argument's sake uh, on on a. You know, uh, but, um, you know, it does give us confidence for sure. You know, we, we you know, we have a huge exploration budget. Uh, we're spending $39 million in exploration this year. We've got a big development budget, I think $65 million on, on underground development we're spending. Um, you know, so, you know, historically, when we set our, our guidance and we set our internal uh, budgets, we use metal prices, of course, because we want to figure out how much cash flow we're going to be generating for the upcoming year. And unfortunately, over the last decade, you know, we've always, you know, projected too high. You know, me being a bull, you know, we'd be projecting, uh, you know, $25 silver. And then next thing you know, it's trading at 21. And then we have to start canceling exploration projects. We have to, you know, lay off people. You know, we have to just, you know, wind down the business or wind down the investments. So right now, I, you know, these kinds of prices are are projections our guidance is actually lower than the current metal prices so we're going to be generating more cash than even what we expected which is always a nice place to be exactly mm -hmm. um reserve pricing is an interesting topic i've had had that discussion with a couple of producers like wh where do you price your reserves at and what does that look like because yeah. depleting assets and everybody's screaming oh you got to replace the you know the ounces you've lost or produced mm -hmm. um how does that look like if you were to up it to let's say 23 24 dollars or so how, how that how would that change the dynamics and the resource or well, the reserves? It, it, well it, it changed it changed is your um, uh, cutoff grade, um, uh, so it does have an impact. Um, it's, it's uh, you, you know, but the QP or the qualified person, you know, who's responsible for that role, you know, he has to follow a regulatory, strict regulatory system. So, you know, with silver at 31 today, we're not going to use 31 for no. our reserves, you know, because, you know, it's been too short lived. So what, what, ten, what they tend to do is use a three year backward average mm -hmm. price. 
Uh, we measure that against what the banks are saying as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll look at the big banks, BMO, TD, and, and so on, and uh, see what their long-term projections for the metal is. And we'll compare that to, and, and we'll even pick up the phone and our, you know, our CFO will call other CFOs of, you know, mining companies in our peer group and say, hey, look, what are you going to be using for your, you know, you know 2025, yeah. you know, uh, metal pricing? And we just, I just received an email yesterday <laughs> from my chief operating officer asking me what I, you know, what I'm thinking. So we're now going through that process for 2025. Interesting. Yeah. On that note, JP Morgan raised their silver price target to $34. And uh, oh, nice. whenever I see JP Morgan put a silver price target out, I got to chuckle <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. You know, it seems like a bit yeah. of an oxymoron, like it doesn't really yeah. fit together. What, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> you know, I don't really look at what the banks really do anyway. So, um, you know, because they're, you know, I'm always suspect. And, and, just uh, given JP Morgan's role overall in the silver market, yeah, they're, they're yeah. the big, biggest player in the space. So you know, are, are, are they are they trying to suck people in so, <laughs> so they can sell more, or they <laughs> actually believe that uh, you know that they want? I don't know. It's just it's yeah. it's really kind of a waste of time talking about JP Morgan and these yeah, other banks. Like, no, it's just, fine. I thought I saw that pop up. I think yesterday or two days ago, it sort of well, popped up in my feed. I, I look, I worked for the banks in the 1980s, right? So uh, I, was, I worked for three of the largest banks in Canada. From 84 to 89 and uh, you know I, I know you know they don't like taking a lot of risk so you know they they they, they um, transfer their risks to their um, um, their clients um, it may show up on their books but um, you know some <laughs> some of the rhetoric that you see you know around these banks sometimes I'm suspicious about you know who's actually behind it and in, in, in previous interviews, you mentioned that uh, there, there are not a lot of pure play silver projects in, mm. in general. Like Very it, few, yeah. they don't they don't really exist. The question is now at you know thirty thirty one dollars silver. Um, do, do you have more financial flexibility to maybe support the sector, maybe help those juniors out, come in as a small investor, maybe take a nine point nine percent position? Is that mm. something you're actively more looking at now? Is that uh, something that's uh, maybe on your agenda for the next six months? Yeah, just going back to your first point, um, the the Lincoln Tad is one hundred percent silver. So it's, it's one of the very few mines that are 100% silver. We've got San Dimas at 50-50 um, silver gold, and then uh, Santa Elena at 60-40 uh, gold silver. Uh, all Dory producers, which is really nice as well. Uh, no, we don't produce any concentrates, so which puts us, I think, uh, a little bit of a strategic advantage. Uh, when it comes to investing in the juniors, we do do it. We, I think, uh, we just gave five million bucks to a company called Sierra Mandre, mm -hmm. uh, which owns the Lucatera mine, which they bought from us, yeah. and then they didn't want to, um, you know, go to the market. So we helped them out a little bit, and um, they, they seem to be a really good team of people, and uh, they're serious. They they want to get Lucatera back up and running. I hear it's going into production very very soon, or it just started. I. It, I don't know if it's just started, but I know they've, they're they working on getting it started. Yeah. Um, it's supposed to be done this year, as far as I can tell. Um, you know, we own positions in a couple other juniors as well, but it's really not, you know, our business, you know, yeah. investing in junior mining stocks. Like, you know, I got to look at why, yeah. right? And, uh, um, you know, our, our, our team is, you know, we have a, we have a big team, but, you know, there's, there's, there's a limited amount of time uh, and, and there's, you know, there's a number of silver companies, including some at this conference, that we've got our eyeballs on. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, some we look at a lot more seriously than others, but we're, we, we're constantly collecting data on any mining company in the silver space. Do you have the financial flexibility uh, doing a, bit of, a bigger takeover potentially, adding, adding to it, to maybe adding a new mine or yeah. late stage development project? Yeah, well, it comes down to liquidity, right? So, so you know, um, our stock, fortunately, is, is one of the most liquid uh, mining stocks in the world, which is kind of <laughs> crazy to say. Um, but, uh, you know, we trade between 5 and 10 million shares a day. Yeah. And uh, um, so for the banks, you know, to look at us, um, you know, we're, you know, we're quite favored because, um, uh, you know, they look at the volume of the stock and, you know, you tr try to raise a uh, hundred million dollars and they say, oh, geez, that's only three days of trading or two days of trading or something, you know, no problem. And you get, you get a check in a week. Um, and then that, and we've been very fortunate that way over the last, you know, several or well, longer than a decade for sure. Yeah. Unintended follow-up question, but what does the balance sheet look like? Because I know with Jared Kenny, you took quite a bit of debt on mm -hmm. as well. Like what, well, what does it look like? So, so much debt. It was a convertible. Well, convertible. Okay. Yeah. So it's convertible at some crazy number, close to $20. So yeah. it's, it's, uh, um, and it comes due in 2027. Yep. The interest rate on that is 0 0.375. Yeah, you'd be stupid like, to pay that off. Eh? Yeah, like, really? <laughs> like, 
you know, it, the, the, the total cost of that was $5 million, you know, for the whole life of that instrument. Okay. So it was like so cheap money. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So we, we should have probably taken more money uh, at the time. Yeah. But, uh, no, we our, our 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 balance sheet's pretty good. Okay. Um, um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but it is in our PowerPoint presentation. We have a liquidity of somewhere around three hundred million, three hundred and thirty million dollars. Yeah, no, it does. It sounds yeah. great. So you can actually make a bigger jump and, and potentially look at something mm -hmm. that that, it, that is around here, potentially at the conference, right? <laughs> um, Let's talk. Like you're the only mining company I know that has its own mint. Mm -hmm. I think not. Not just no. I think you are the only mining company that has its own mint. I'm pretty right? sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, tell Tell me how is the ramp up going? Like you, you you just launched it just about six months ago, I believe. So mm -hmm. curious. Uh, how is it going? It's going well. Uh, we're only producing three products. We're pr producing a kilo bar, ten ounce bar, five ounce bar. We just had the machines arrive. Uh, there's a mint in uh, the United Kingdom that uh, um, was shut down. It's a historic. Uh, mint uh, we bought five of their machines they just arrived at the mint uh, about three weeks ago now and they're just being installed so those machines will be producing rounds so mm -hmm. coins uh, so we'll start producing coins probably september october time frame so we'll add to our our our, our, our list of SKUs at that point uh, but you know it's quite exciting because um, um you know we did it because the mints just would not give us the metal mm -hmm. you know we, we would be shipping them um, you know, our, 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 you know, thousand ounce commercial bars and these, ma these ounces would just sit on the floor and we were saying, come on, like, you know, and our, you know, my finance department was getting, you know, you know, irritated because, you know, our inventories kept climbing and climbing and climbing and we've got all this valuable metal. Uh, I think at one point our inventories were $15 million or something crazy. And I said, uh, no, enough is enough. Yeah. You know, we just so we put the team together, got a couple of really good people. We uh, chose Vegas uh, just due to its location and its convenience, and uh, uh, and uh, the team is working hard. And uh, yeah, we're pretty excited about it. Are you going to send 100% of your metal or Dory uh, to the mint? Is that we, the plan in the end? We hope to, and I, I'd, I'd actually like to get uh, some of the other miners as well to send their metal to the mint. You know, because yeah. uh, you know, as I said earlier today in my presentation, you know, the leverage is 230 to one. So, so the banks know they're getting our 10 million ounces. Mm -hmm. So that's 2.3 billion ounces that trade in the paper market yeah. is equivalent of our physical production. So if, you know, if we can successfully get our entire production through our mint, that, you know, really yeah. takes a lot of paper away from the banks. Uh, and if I could convince, you know, the sector or at least part of the sector to also do the same thing, then, you know, all of a sudden we start pulling some of this paper away and maybe, you know, we'll see, you know, better pricing. It's sort of effectively withholding uh, physical metal from from the main markets, like mm -hmm. what everybody's been sort of screaming for almost. Like we see that a lot in the comments. It's like, oh, why don't the miners just withhold their, their production mm -hmm. and just to price gauge a little bit, you know, it's like to, to squeeze the market themselves yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, bring back maybe some of the pricing power mm -hmm. that uh, the producers don't have at all. Like, right. like the OPEC uh, oil producers, they have a bit of pricing mm -hmm. power because mm -hmm. they can control how much oil they produce on a right. daily basis. Right? And uranium is the same way, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's crazy the way, you know, the, the mining sector allows the banks to price its metal. And it's been going on since the 70s. And uh, it's so convenient, though, you know, it, and that's what gives them the advantage, because, you know, if we, you know, if we want to sell 100,000 ounces of silver, it's a it's an email. Boom. <laughs> and it's like I get a fill like that. And, and then we get paid three days later. Right? And it's just like, oh, this is pretty easy. <laughs> so why why even bother? You know, you know, you're going to have a sales force that are going to phone up Tesla and phone up BMW and phone up <laughs> Samsung and Apple and say, hey, you want to buy our silver? You know, you could do it, and that's why I'm suggesting, or have a, uh, a, a, a even an agent that's going to act for the mining sector to sell direct and bypass the banks. You know, that's what I really like to see. I'm interviewing Phillips Baker later. He's the chairman of the Silver Institute. Do, do you no, see the Silver that. Institute potentially take on that role, like become an OPEC plus for for silver? I don't we're, know. We're, we're not a member of the Silver Institute, okay. and uh, and Phil's no longer the chairman. Um, oh, he, he stepped yeah. down? Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm canceling that interview. <laughs> well, because um, when, he, he, when, when he left Hecla, yeah. they, they um, according to their um, mandate, I guess, yeah. well, you, you need to be an executive. Kind of makes, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, so he's, uh, but he's been a great spokesman. And, yeah. uh, you know, Michael Steinman, you know, Brad Cook, who passed away, yeah. obviously, uh, was, was the previous president. Now, Phil's mm -hmm. now was um, the head of that. But no, I, I personally don't think they do enough. 
Um, you know, when, you know, when I'm watching television, I see the World Gold Council uh, ad come up. I'm just shocked. You know, and or, or you know, when I um, and we and the silver space doesn't even talk about silver at all. You know, they talk about jewelry and uh, things like that. And uh, it's just uh, I could go on and on about the Silver <laughs> Institute, but no, I, I, I think we need a whole re reset yeah. because I don't think the space, the silver space, does a good job in really promoting the metal. Yeah, it sounds like it because it's just newsletter writers I hear or some of the keynote speakers talk about the uses, the applications and how it's just part of everyday life, mm -hmm. not yeah. the Silver Institute. No, they don't do that. They no. actually just like when I look at the numbers, I think they're actually short on some of this stuff, like looking at uh, the uh, solar panel mm -hmm. and the ex uh, expected consumption of solar panel uh, ounces for solar yeah. just doesn't make any sense. No, for example. So, that, no, that, and, those and, are and, 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 you know, it's it's uh, I know for a fact because I've spoken to many consumers of silver, like jewelry companies and the and, and, and electronics companies that actually consume the stuff. And uh, and I've asked them directly, you know, have you ever got a phone call from the Silver Institute or have you got a phone call from Metals Focus, who's the company they use to uh, yeah. and they n mm. never have. Never have. So, well, you know, these numbers are all made up. Keith, sort of last question, maybe just sum it up and put a bow around First Majestic as well. What are some of the catalysts we can expect from the company over the next three to six months? Well, we had a great uh, news release on expiration for Sandemus just a few weeks ago, and um, people should look at that because we're having some great success there. Um, as I said earlier, we we're spending $39 million yeah. in, in exploration. Um, uh, we just launching exploration at Jarrett Canyon next week. Mm -hmm. It'll be the first uh, exploration program there since uh, we shut it down. So we're spending $10 million at Jarrett Canyon. Uh -huh. So, you know, people should be looking for news there. Now we have a news release, I'm hoping, uh, in mid to late August on exploration results from uh, St. Helena. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're having some great success there as well. So, you know, just watch for those things. And of course, you know, as we get through the year, you know, production levels will start to get back up to normal, normalized levels at both San Dimas and Lincoln Tata. So I think we're going to end off the year on a pretty good note. Fantastic, guys, especially with cash flow increasing as well at $31. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. For Keith, sure. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure chatting with you as always. And uh, thanks so much for joining us here in our little podcast studio. Thank right. you so much. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in here to the Gold Newsletter. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you did, leave a like, leave a comment, and of course, subscribe to the channel. Helps us out tremendously getting guests like Keith on the program. And uh, we really want to hear from you. Put it down in the comments below. What do you think? Is the Silver Institute doing enough? What are the uses of solar? Are you invested? Are you buying bullion? Have you bought the Freedom Bar? Really curious to hear from you. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on the Gold Newsletter channel.